uh, now we look to EOQ. EOQ is economic order quantity model. EOQ is used to determine the optimal order size for an inventory item after taking into account its expect usage, ordering, and storage costs. So that total inventory costs are minimized. Okay, so provided here, total inventory equals to total ordering cost plus total handling. Okay, so ordering costs here include administration costs of placing and receiving orders, uh, which consists of the cost of writing and purchase order, processing it and checking it with the invoice. And handling costs include storage costs, insurance costs, costs of deterioration and obsolescence, and the opportunity opportunity cost of funds invested in inventory okay now let's look to an example even here the demand is 10,000 unit ordering cost is 500 ringgit handling cost is rm200 okay so uh, the formula that will be used to calculate the eoq is square root 2 times D times O divided by H. Okay, so we key in the form we key in the the information uh which is will be square root 2 times 10,000 times 500 ringgit and divided by 200 ringgit. The answer that we will get is 223.6. Uh, so we have to run run off the answer because we can't order for 223.6 unit so we can uh, we have to run off it to be 224 unit to be ordered at one time okay so uh, then use the formula given before which is total inventory cost equals to total ordering cost plus total handling cost uh, to calculate ordering cost, we have to times the ordering cost with demand divided by EOQ. And to calculate handling cost, we have to times the handling cost with EOQ divided by 2. Okay, key in based on the formula. Uh, then, uh, key in the formula we, which is ordering cost 500 times demand 10,000 uh, divided by EOQ 2 to 4 units plus uh, 200 handling cost, 224 EOQ divided by 2. Okay, so the answer that we will get is 44,721 ringgit 43 cent. Okay, this means that the optimal size for each order is 224 units that cost RM 44,000 721 ringgit and 43 cents. So next is ABC system. ABC system. So next is ABC system. ABC system is based on the value of material. It is divided into three categories A, B, and C. Category A consists of the items with the highest value. They are closely monitored on daily basis and is a perpetual inventory system. Category B consists of the next highest value items. They are monitored on a weekly basis. Category C consists of low value items. They are monitored using two bin method. To be met by using to be method, the business can monitor the quantity of an item left behind and it is mainly used for small or low value items. For example, the business produces fabric, they are silk, linen and cotton. Silk is more expensive than linen and cotton so it will be in category A. Linen is more expensive than cotton but has low value than silk so it will be in category B. Cotton has the lowest value so
sector will be in the category C. So the business will focus more to produce seal. Just in time system or JIT system. JIT system is cost accounting purchasing strategy. Material ordered arrive just in time when they are needed in production. Only have inventory in work in progress. Material that ordered just enough to use in production. This is because one of the characteristics of JIT system is nearest zero stock level. This also can save in terms of storage cost, inspection, waiting time, and reduce damages and outdated of the stock. For example, Dell computer. As a computer manufacturing company, Dell allows customers to purchase computers directly online. Everything from the hard drive to features such as color and screen white is custom ordered. As soon as the order is finalized, the raw materials and parts are ordered. The raw materials are then assembled and made ready for the customer in a relatively short period of time. Therefore, result in manufacturing is more efficiency. That's all. Thank you. Materials Requirement Planning MRP system is to determine the type of materials to order and when to order them, meaning that you need to know how much raw materials you need to buy and when you need to buy. You have to properly plan it out so that you won't end up buying things that you don't need. For example, in order for you to make nasi lemak, what are the ingredients that you need? You need rice, sambal, eggs, cucumber, ikan bilis, and so on. So you need to know exactly how much raw materials needed in order to minimize the cost and avoid wastage. For example, you want to produce 50 units of nasi lemak. You need to know exactly how much of the rice needed, the eggs needed and the sambal, and when to order them to avoid from the ingredients being spoiled. So the main objective of MRP system is to minimize the cost but maximize the production, meaning that you want to minimize the cost of raw materials of nasi lemak but at the same time maximize the production of nasi lemak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's me Wan Wan Muaz Wambi from KSC 1104H. And today I will explain to you about slide number 11 of the management of current asset which is account receivable management. Okay, the first one is whenever a sale is made on credit, it will increase the firm account receivable. So, if the firm made a sale credit, it will increase the firm account receivable. Okay. The next one is point number two is account receivable typically comprise 20, about 20% 20 of a firm asset. Okay. Usually a firm will use about 20% of its firm asset for the account receivable. So they usually make sale credit about 20% of the firm asset. Okay. The third one is this Account receivable management begin with decision of whether or not to grant credit. So, the firm will there is a factor that will affect the account receivable management whether or not to grant or not whether or not to grant credit to the firm. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Of investment in account receivable. There are many factors that will affect the size of investment in account receivable. The first one is percentage of credit sales to total sales. The nature of the business tend to determine the bank between credit sales and cash sales. For example, supermarket and manufacturing company. Supermarket will usually use cash basis while manufacturing company will use credit basis. So, the percentage of 
credit sales to total sales for supermarket is less as compared to manufacturing company because manufacturing company use credit basis. So, the credit sales for manufacturing company per total sale will higher compared to supermarket. So, the second one is level of sales. The more the sales, the greater the size of account receivable. For example, in the same industry, a firm with high sales volume will have larger size of account receivable as compared to a firm with small sales volume. Uh, when you when you can achieve higher sales of volume, so the your size of account receivable will also increase. Okay, I will proceed with slide number thirteen, which is the size of investment in accounts receivables. Credit and collection policies is a set of decisions that include a firm's credit period, credit standards, collection procedures, and discount offered. Okay, credit and collection policies is a document that includes clear written guidelines that set the terms and conditions for supplying goods on credit, customer qualification criteria, Procedure for making collections and steps to be taken in case of customer delinquency. Along with cash and inventories, accounts receivable is one of the most important assets a company has. The more predictable and effective your account receivable can be converted, the healthier your cash flow will be. The credit period, which is the length of time buyers are given to pay for their purchases. Okay. The credit period is a time frame between when a customer purchases a product and when the customer's payment is due. For example, a firm established a credit terms of 210 net 30. This means that if the customer pay within 10 days, he will get 2% discount. If the customer pays after 10 days, the customer have to pay the full invoice price within 30 days. This 30 day time frame, this 30 day time frame is considered the credit period. It's the amount of time the seller is giving the buyer credit for the transaction. The credit standards, which refer to the minimum financial strength of acceptable credit customers and the amount of credit available to different customers. Okay. Credit standards for customer may change from time to time. The less strict in credit standards by increasing account receivable will lead to higher sales volume, which in turn increase profit. However, it will also increase debt collection efforts and chances of bad debts. On the other hand, if credit standards were tightened by decreasing account receivable, will lead to lower sales volume and results in lower profit. However, the chances of bad debts will be lower. The firm's collection policy, which is measured by its toughness or laxity in following up on slow-paying accounts. A um, collection policy is a set of procedures to identify ma what methods credit personnel will use to collect receivables, especially past due accounts. The collection procedure should be prioritized according to both the customer's risk and exposure level. Any discounts given for early payment, including the discount amount and period. This I have already discussed in credit period. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. For the slide 14, it's about determining of investment in account receivable. The first component is the percentage of credit sales to the total sales. For example, 30% of the total sales is credit sales. Next, the level of sales. 
the more the stress the greater the account receivable basically the more the stress the greater the credit stress next is the credit and collection policy this is the set of decision that already been decided by the firm about the credit period the credit standard and the collection policy also any discount that been given for the early payment and the discount amount when the information is being collected uh, for the percentage of credit sales and the level sales we get the level of credit sales for the credit and collection policy we will we'll get the length of time before the credit sales are being collected when the two information is being compared the firm can decide whether to invest in the account receivable or not okay that's all thank you okay so for your terms of sale it is to identify the possible discount for early payment the discount period and the total credit period which is to encourage the debtor to pay early than the date has that has been given so the generally it is stated in the form of a over b net c which is a indicate customer can deduct a percent if the account paid within b days and B is the duration for the cash discount. And net C is the account must be paid in CDs within or, with original price. For example, trade credit terms of 2% net 30 indicate that a 2% discount can be taken if the account is paid within 10 days. Otherwise, it must be paid within 30 days. If the customer has decided to forego the discount, which is 2% discount, and not pay until the final payment date, the customer has the use of money for the time period between the discount date and the final payment date. However, the failure to take the discount represents a cost to the customer. So this is the method to count to calculate the cost for forgoing the discount, which is A over 1 minus A times 360 days over C minus B. So for an for instance, if the terms of 2 over 10 net 30 the annualized opportunity cost of passing up this 2% in order to withhold payment for an additional 20 days, which is after, um, within 30 days, is 0 0.02 over 1 minus 0 0.02 times 360 days over 30 days minus 10 days, which is uh, the final answer will be 36.73. This is uh, the answer for the cost of foregoing the discount, which is bad by the customer. So that's all. Thank you. Process of credit selection is known by the type of customer. It is to determine who is to qualify for trade credit. The fault costs vary directly with the quality of the customer. As the customer's credit rating declines, the chance that the account will not be paid on time increases. Collection costs also increase as the quality of the customer declines. The decline in customer quality results in increased cost of credit investigation, collection, and default. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. For the slide 18 is about the continuation of slide before. The process of credit selection in type of customer. Before the management grant the credit to a person or a customer, they will collect the information about the customer the customer short run ability and the inclination to pay the credit for example in short run ability is the liquidation ratio the ability for the customer to turn their asset into money in the short term in one of the way that individual and the firm are often evaluate as the credit risk is through the use of credit scoring and the 5CS system. Okay, thank you. Now, we will move to the first technique of credit selection, the 5C system. Financial institutions attempt to mitigate the risk of lending to borrowers by performing a credit analysis on individuals or businesses applying for a new credit account or loan. So, these are the five factors used to evaluate credit risk. The first one is character. Character refers to the probability that the customers will try to honor their obligations. 
Experienced credit managers frequently insist that the moral factor is the most important issue in a credit evaluation. This is also known as track records for repaying debts of the customer. This information will appear on the customer's credit reports. Lenders can evaluate the customer's credit risk and predict the likelihood that the customer will repay a loan on time. The next one is capacity. Capacity is the customer's ability to pay. Customer's ability to repay a loan is based on the proposed amount and terms. How the customer uses the money also influence the lender's desire to accept the loan application. For a business loan, financial institutions will review the company's cash flow statement. And for a personal loan, they must provide detailed information about the income that they earn as well as the stability of the employment. The third one is capital. Capital is measured by the general financial condition of a firm as indicated by an analysis of financial statements. For a business loan, personal investment into the firm, retained earnings and other assets controlled by the business owner is considered as capital. For a personal loan, it consists of savings or investment account balances. Lenders will view this capital as an additional means to repay the debt obligation should the income or revenue be interrupted while the loan is still in repayment. Next is collateral. Collateral is represented by the assets the customer may offer as a security in order to obtain credit. This will help customers secure loans. Lenders also have assurance that if the customer does not pay the repayments, they can get something back by repossessing the collateral. For example, auto loans, cars, mortgage, houses. Applications for a secure loan are looked up more favorably than the unsecured loans. For example, of an unsecured loan is signature loan, also known as good faith loan. The lender will only require the borrower's signature and a promise to pay as a collateral. A signature loan can be used for anything. And lastly, condition. Condition reverse refers to both general economic trends and to special developments in certain geographic regions or sectors of the economy that might affect customers' abilities to meet their obligations. Conditions refer to the terms of the loan itself, as well as any economic conditions that might affect, affect the borrower. Business lenders review conditions such as strength or weaknesses of the overall economy and the purpose of the loan. Assalamualaikum, my name is Yasmin Dirozi. Today, I'm going to be presenting the second technique of credit selection, which is credit scoring. Credit scoring is a statistic analysis used by lenders and financial institutions. The purpose of credit scoring is to help them determine whether to extend or deny credit from customers. Uh, credit score, the, the number of credit scores are between 200 to 850 being the 850 as the highest possible credit score. A credit score determines the customer's credit strength, so it is used uh, whether to determine whether the customer may or may not uh, able to pay back. I think that's all. Thank you. Okay. The next slide is about credit monitoring and collection policy. What is me a credit monitoring? Credit monitoring is an ongoing review of a firm's accounts receivable to determine whether customers are paying according to the state credit terms. Credit term is the payment requirements state on a state on invoice. Example of credit terms is like two ten net thirty. If you see this, it is called credit terms. Um, it means that if the bill is paid within 10 days, there is a 2% discount. The, otherwise, the total amount is due within a 30 days. Okay. The the key to maintaining maintaining control over the collection of accounts receivable is the fact that the probability of default increase with the age of the account. Thus, control of accounts receivable focus on the control and elimination of past due receivable. Uh, elimination of past 
due receiver you can call bad debts bad debts next the techniques that we can use to monitor the firm's account receivable is first average collection period average collection period is the average number of days that credit sales are outstanding the formula to calculate the average collection period is 365 days divided by the accounts receivable turnover ratio. An, an increase in the average collection period may be the result of a predetermined plan to extend credit terms or the consequence of poor credit administration. Second, aging of accounts receivable. Aging of account receivable is a schedule that indicates the percentage of the total accounts receivable balance that have been outstanding for specified periods of time. Its purpose is to allow the firm to pinpoint problems. This is the example of aging account receivable. Third, the ratio of receivables to assets. Receivable, receivables as receivable as a percentage of current assets would reveal the size of receivables in current asset and the opportunity cost associated with it. The higher the percentage, the higher the cost of carrying the receivable. It is therefore advised that a firm needs to carry the least percentage of receivables as possible without affecting the sales volume. Next, accounts receivable turnover ratio. This technique measures how many times a firm can collect each average account receivable during the year. The formula is net credit sales divided by the average account receivable for that period. Higher ratio would be more favorable as it shows the firm that it as it shows that the firm are collecting their receivables more frequently during the year. And the last one is ratio of bad debts to credit sales. The formula to use this technique is the amount of bad debt is divided by the total of account receivable for a period and multiply by 100. An increase in the ratio may indicate too many weak accounts or an aggressive market expansion policy. Collection techniques is one of the ways to collect debts from debtors. It is also known as a reminder or notice from creditors to debtors. The first one is through letters. After a certain number of days, the firm sends a polite letter reminding the customer of the overdue account. If the account is not paid within a certain period after this letter has been sent, a second more demanding letter is sent. The second one is through telephone calls. If letters prove unsuccessful, a telephone call may be made to request immediate payment. If the customer has a reasonable excuse, arrangement may be made to extend the payment period. The third one is through personal visits, which is by sending a local salesperson or a collection person to confront the customer. For example, by going to their houses or their companies. If the previous methods are still unsuccessful, the next one is by using uh, collection agencies. A firm can turn uncollectible accounts over to a collection agency or an attorney for collection. The last step is through legal action, which is an alternative to the use of a collection agency. This is the most stringent step in which it can force the debtor into bankruptcy. Stringent here means strict. It is the last possible way to collect debt from debtors because the debtor will have more liability compared to the asset. That's why they could become bankrupt. I think that's all. Thank you. Uh, we'll continue with the collection technique, which we have five collection techniques. And we continue the third one is by personal visit. And the fourth one is the collection agencies. And the last one is, is the legal action. Uh, the third one is the personal visit, which means you send a salesperson to your customer to collect the data means that uh, you meet your customer by face to face uh, like that. that's why we call it as personal visit and the fourth one is the uh, the collection agencies which means you can collect all the uncollect 
profitable account uh, and turn it turn over to the collection agencies or to an attorney so that they for the collection uh, and then the last one is the uh, legal action this is the last step that you can take because after you have done a lot of techniques to collect the data but then your customer did not respond and you know ignore you so that you can take legal action to your customer uh, which have this is the uh, alternative to the use uh, of a collection agency and this is the start which can lead to the bankruptcy of the debtors of the debtors. that's all thank you management of cash Cash is the currency and coin the firm has on hand in petty cash drawers, in cash registers, or in checking or money market accounts, often called a non-earning asset. Non-earning asset are asset which do not deliver returns. This may include money invested in non-interest bearing bank accounts and real estate or other property which does not ge generate an income or gain in value over time. Earning assets can be considered in can be considered investments, while non-earning assets can be considered liability. Cash management is mainly concerned with maintaining the liquidity of a firm, so as to minimize the risk of insolvency. A firm becomes insolvent when it is unable to meet its maturing liabilities on time because it lacks the necessary liquidity to meet prompt payment on its current debt obligation. Therefore, the financial manager must strike an acceptable balance between holding too much or too little cash. For example, Calif Limited has the policy to pay off its creditors in 60 days and gives a credit period of 30 days to its customer. Also, it doesn't hold an inventory of more than 3 days. How should the company manage cash flows? Since the payment is done in 60 days and realization is made for debtors and inventory in 40 days, there is idle cash for 20 days. In order to optimally optimally utilize the same, the company should find an opportunity to invest and maximize the profitability. Thank you. Management of cash. Um, the management of cash focus more in maintaining the liquidity of a firm by minimize the amount of firm must have or hold to manage its business activities from the risk of insolvency. A firm becomes Insolvent if the business unable to meet its maturing liabilities due to lack of liquidity to make payment on current debt obligation. Therefore, if the firm has sufficient cash, the firm can take discount when make an early payment. Second, to maintain its credit rating by keeping its current and asset test ratios in line with those of other firms in its industry. Um, Asset test ratios can be calculated by taking business assets and divide with current liabilities. Next uh, is to meet the unexpected cash needs such as strikes, fires, or competitors' marketing campaign, and also weather or cyclical downturns. And lastly, to take advantage of favorable business such as special offers from suppliers or chance to acquire another firm if the firm managed to holding the sufficient cash. So I'm gonna continue the motive for holding cash. First the uh, first for transaction balance. Transaction balance is a cash balance associated with payment and collections. The balance necessary for day to day operations. The relative amount of cash needed to satisfy Five transaction requirement is affected by a number of factors such as the industry in which the firm operates. For example, utilities firms have less transaction balance compared to computer software firms. Transaction balance, also known as cash help for the purpose of making payment, they arise in the ordinary course of doing business of doing business and it is used to cover day-to-day -day transaction. 
Usually, transactions include regular cash outflows such as payment of wages, utilities, as well as outflows for acquisition of inventories and non-current assets. The amount of cash needed for transaction requirements will vary from industry to industry. It will be easier to predict future cash flows for utilities firms than for computer software companies. For example of transaction balance is payment of salaries, materials, and so on. Thank you. Assalamualaikum, my name is Azlina and all my friends. Today, I will be talking about precautionary balance. Before that, my name is Muhammad Mahfiz bin Ahmad Ahi. Alright, precautionary balance is also known as contingency funds. It is a cash balance that is held in reserve for any emergency or unexpected outflows of fund that may be occurred in the future. Alright, um, the less predictable the companies or the firm's cash flow, the higher the balance should be. But if the company has an easy access for borrowing funds, then the needs for the precautionary balance is reduced. As for example, we can take airline industry such as AirAsia and Firefly. Um, they have high precautionary balance because of high degree of cash flows uncertainty. Alright, thank you. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Rahimi bin Ramli. Today I want to explain to you about motive for holding cash. Second motive for holding cash is speculative balance. Uh, speculative balance is a cash balance that is held to enable the firm to take advantage of any bargain purchase that might arise. For example, construction company will have a large speculative balance in anticipation of a significant drop in lumber cost. Uh, I want to make you easy to uh, understand. I give you a new example. For example, uh, when interest rate are high, people prefer to buy bond because they believe that the net movement in the rate of interest will be downward, so the bond price will increase and they will make a capital gain. Okay. For a third point is compensating balance. Cons compensating balance is a checking account balance that a firm must maintain with a bank to compensate the bank for the services rendered or for the granting alone. Uh, what I understand about compensating balance is compensating balance is a minimum bank account balance that a borrower agrees to maintain with a lender. The purpose of this balance is to reduce the lender cost for the lender since the lender can invest the cash located in the compensating bank account and keep some or all of the proceeds. Let's see risk return trade-off. Risk return trade-off related between firm's current asset and liquidity, risk of insolvency and profitability. The first one is the financial manager must write an acceptable balance between holding too much cash and too little cash. It means that the financial manager must know proper amount to achieve. Second note, a large cash investment minimizes the chance of insolvency but penalizes company profitability. When you invest more money in investment, you will have more asset. When you have more asset, you will get higher chances for the asset to be converted to money. Since you have more asset to be converted to money, you does not have any reason to not pay your debt. This will minimize the chances of insolvency. But this action will penalize your company profitability since you invest more money on investment. And the last one is a small cash investment Price access balance for investment in both marketable security and long lease asset. This enhances company profitability and the value of the firm common shares, but increases the chances of running out of cash. The last one is the opposite for the second one, since you 
invest a little cash in investment, your chances to get the asset back is low and that's why it will cause running out of cash. Thank you. Cash planning. Necessary to prepare a statement of the firm's plan, inflows and outflows of cash known as a cash budget. Cash budget is an estimate of the firm's short-term cash requirement, usually covering one year period which is further divided into smaller time intervals. Cash budget indicates whether a cash shortage or surplus would be expected in the time covered by the forecast. Cash budget allows an organization to set a goal and move toward that goal. It is important to an organization because a cash budget is a way to determine if a company has the cash necessary to meet upcoming obligations and to trigger corrective actions if a company experiences cash budget problems. For example, a company experiencing cash budget problems may need to borrow money in the short term for emergency equipment repairs, the payments of taxes or monthly payroll. The right procedures ensure the business is operating at its important at its most optimal level. Cash planning can save time and money if the business use it effectively. It gain a better understanding because Learning about cash budget is a power to run the business in a smart way. Hello and assalamualaikum everyone. My name is Muhammad Izzuddin bin Muhammad Zahir. I'm from class KAC 1104H. Now, I will continue my presentation in topic Management of Current Asset, which is in page 32. Okay, I want to explain to you all about one of the subtopic management of current asset, which is management of receipt and payment. First and foremost, do you all know what is the focus management of receipt and payment? Now, I will tell you all about it. The receipt, processing and collection time for the firm, both from its customer and to its supplier, is the focus of receipt and payment management. Why? It is to ensure that the business transaction are keep up to date with the transaction that occur within the business. Okay, next, we will continue with the second point, which is fluid. As you know, there is usually a time gap between the time the check is written and which is cleared. This time gap is known as a fluid. In simple words, Float refers to the period that passes before a payment or receipt is made by the bank. Other than that, float is also important in the cash conversion cycle. Do you know why? Because it presents lenders both to the firm average collection period and its average payment period. Do you all want to know more about float? You can check it up at the next slide. That's all from me. Thank you and Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum to Lamarakatu. I will present three components of fluid. But before that, I would like to briefly explain definition of fluid. Fluid is a funds that have been sent but are not yet usable. And there are three components of fluid. First, main fluid, second, processing fluid, and lastly, clearing fluid. Main fluid is time delay between when payment is placed in the mail and when it is received. Processing fluid is time between receipt of payment and is deposit into the firm's account, while clearing fluid is time between deposit of the payment and when spendable funds become available to the firm. Okay, as an example, Main fluid start when company A write a check to company B and put it in the mail. At that point, the available balance in company A's bank account doesn't decrease, but the book value of their bank account decreases. 
This is because company A track their outflow on their own. Once company B receives the check and deposit it, company B's bank will request the fund from company A's bank. And this is uh, when processing fluid happen. Clearing fluid start when company B receives the check, record that they have the payment and take it to the bank. At that point, the book value of company B's bank account has increased since the check has been recorded. But the available fund in the bank have not increased because the fund haven't been verified and transferred over. And when they are usually between two until four days later, and clearing fluid ends when the actual cash is in company B's account. Thank you. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, now I want to explain about the technique for managing fluid. For speeding up collection, speeding up collection reduces the customer collection float time and reduces the firm's average collection period. So, to accomplish this, we can use lockbox system. So, what is lockbox system? Okay, first of all, I want all of you to imagine this you as a customer. Bank Islam as the firm's bank and Madam Azina as the firm's account. Okay. Now, you want to mail the payments to Madam Azina, but how? By mail the payments to a post office box that is emptied regularly by Bank Islam. Why the post office box is emptied regularly by the Bank Islam? Ah, this is the lock box system. The post office box is emptied specially for the customer and for the firms and for the Madam Azina lah, to process the payments and deposits to the firm's account. So, I hope you understand that. And the advantage of lock box is to reduce the mail time clearing time and processing time that's all thank you assalamualaikum i am arif and i will be presenting the 35th slide which is about a uh, technique for managing fluid so the second technique is slowing down payment slowing down payment by using controlled dispersing which involve the strategic use of mailing point and bank account to lengthen mail flow and clearing float. So basically in this technique, uh, we will use the mail to post our check and it may have a delayed time before the creditors can collect our payment. That's why we call it as a slow down payment. Okay, next, the third technique. The third technique is cash concentration. Cash concentration process used to bring lock and other deposits together into the bank um, it's mean any transfer from or any deposit from the multiple account or multiple area will be collected and sort into a main account or a central account of the creditors company uh, and, it, and it in this technique may improve the efficiency of the cash management ok continue the transfer of cash concentration bank can be achieved through the following mechanism which is the depository transfer check or we call it as a DTC DTC is a unsigned check drawn on one of a firm bank account and deposited in another once the DTC is cleared then the transfer is complete so what have I understand about the DTC is it's for a unsigned check from any account or area and it will be assigned to DTC where it will be checked once it has it have been clear and it will be transferred to the main account of our creditor that have reset that's all for me.
Thank you. Techniques for managing flood. The second one is automated clearinghouse transfer. It is a pre-authorized electronic withdrawal from the payer's account and deposit into the payer's account via a settlement among banks by the automated clearinghouse. It means that an electronic payment was made to or from your account using your checking account information. The third one is a wire transfer. It is an electronic communication that via bookkeeping entries removes funds from the payer's bank and deposits them in the base bank. It can be made from one bank to another bank account through a transfer of cash. Senders pay for the transaction at the remitting bank and provide recipient's name, bank, account number and amount transferred. The last one is a zero balance account. It is a disbursement account that always have an end of day balance of zero. It is a type of checking account that receives only enough funds from concentration account to cover checks presented each day in order to maintain a balance of zero. I think that's all. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nuhari Syamit Abdullah and I will represent about the advantages of using cash concentration. The first advantage is it creates a large pool of funds for use in making short-term investment where the business can improve their investment potential as well as they easily can uh, detect their availability and visibility of their cash flow. Then the second advantage is improved tracking and internal control of the firm since all the cash have deposit into one account. So it easily the firm to the firm to control their cash flow. And the third advantage is it allow the firm to implement payment strategies that reduce either cash that reduce either cash balance. Um, because the cash have deposit in one account, so the firm can uh, easily make the strategies and manage their cash so that they have no more added cost. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Fatiha Anissa Binti Asmawi and I'm from KAC1104H. Okay, right now I'm going to discuss the topic of marketable securities. What is marketable securities? Marketable securities is the securities or debt that can be sold or redeemed in short-term period within a year. Um, this marketable security is also known as near cash assets. This liquid financial instrument can easily convert into cash without losing face value. This marketable securities um, public can buy these marketable securities at reasonable value. Okay. There are several examples for marketable securities which are common stock, treasury bills, commercial paper and other money market instruments. Okay. Highly liquid short term securities either issued by the government or by the strongest corporation. Okay when the marketable securities will be used if the company are sudden need for cash or to prepare them for situation in which they may need to act swiftly or the company may facing insolvency issues they can easily liquidate their securities to the public thank you that's all from me uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Ahmad Bizar Shahmi bin Azri and I'm from uh, class uh, KAC 1104H. So I will present uh, about slide 99, uh, 39 and it's about uh, marketable securities. Marketable securities means a uh, short term or financial asset that create interest for its holder, holders and easily can be converted into cash. They are security or debts uh, that are to be sold or redeemed within, within a year. At any time, a security holder can sell this security in the financial market and can collect cash from selling this security. Uh, marketable securities 
uh, used to is a uh, security that can be sold on short notice and also called uh, as near cash asset security investment that the firm can quickly convert into cash balance and this is highly this is highly liquid uh, short term securities either issued by government or by the very strong corporation uh, reason for holding market uh, marketable securities is as a substitute for cash to keep liquidity and as temporary investment uh, to earn interest uh, as a safety stock just in case uh, to take advantage of opportunity in case uh, we run out of cash that's all for me thank you okay now i'm going to continue I explain about the last slide of management of current assets. It is about factors influencing the choice of marketable securities. The first one is default risk. Default risk is the risk that a borrower will not pay the interest or principal on a loan. A higher level of risk leads to a higher required return. So when the amount of debt is high, the borrower will likely fail to pay their debts. So default risk will occur. The second one is interest rate risk. Interest rate risk is the potential for investment losses that results from a change in interest rate. The risk of declines in bonds prices to which investors are exposed due to rising interest rates. It can be reduced through diversification of bond maturities. The third one is inflation risk. The risk that inflation will reduce the purchasing power of a given sum of money. Uh, inflation risk affects all types of securities, but its effect is seen more in high inflationary economy where price level commodities rises drastically every year. The rise in price level reduces the value of money. The fourth one is marketable risk. The risk that securities cannot be sold at close to the quoted market price, which uh, will force the owner to sell assets for less than its actual value. The last one is yield return on securities. Uh, yields means the income returned on an investment. For example, interest received from holding a security.